Thank you for the introduction. Does it work? It does work. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before the introduction of the Bernese PAO at our institution, these plastic hips were mainly treated by shelf arthroplasty or by salto osteotomy with femoral varization. The first Bernese PAO was performed in March 1984. The technique offered the advantage of an intact posterior column, which decreased the time of partial weight bearing. And in addition, it has a great potential of acetabular reorientation. These are the x-rays of the very first Bernese PAO. It was a young lady at the age of 13 years with a so-called proximal focal femoral deficiency. And it was certainly not a standard PAO. This is its inventor, Professor Gantz, at the very early days in the 80s, operating on a hip. And about 10 years later, he published uh, the first outcome of a series of patients. These were the very first 75 patients ever undergoing the Bernese PAO between 1984 and 87. And he found an 88% survival rate at the 10-year follow-up. Another 10 years later, we re-evaluated the same 75 patients and we found that the survival rate of the native hip was 61% and these results were uh, presented at the hip symposium in 2008. And now it's time for the 30 year follow-up. And we rose the question, are the results of PAO still good looking like the, its inventor 30 years later does? The aims of the study were to evaluate the 30-year survival rate, the hip function and pain, progression of osteoarthritis, and predictive factors for failure in these series of very first 75 hips. It's a retrospective case series. The majority of patients were female patients, and the mean age was 29 years. But there was a, a vast uh, range for the age at operation. The youngest was 13 and the oldest 56 years old. The indication was symptomatic hip dysplasia. 44% had a subluxation and in 5% there was a high dislocation of the hip. Almost half of the patient had previous surgery or a relevant comorbidity, including the PFFD uh, you have seen or a post-traumatic deficiency or neuromuscular disorders. And at that time, 20% of the hips had a concomitant intertrochanteric varus osteotomy. 30 years later, 43 hips converted to a total hip. Uh, this uh, results in 32 hips that uh, had prese uh, prese uh, preserved joint. We were able to follow them up, except three of them, they died to a cause unrelated to surgery. And we could follow up about 92% with a routine clinical and radiographic follow-up at our outpatient clinic. And in six hips, we only had a phone or questionnaire follow-up. We then calculated the survival rate using the Kaplan-Meier analyses. We defined uh, three endpoints, conversion to total hip arthroplasty, and then also secondary, uh, secondary endpoints, the progression of osteoarthritis or a Mel Dobinier score of less than 15 points at uh, the most recent follow-up. We evaluated all, also pain and function using the Mel Dobinier score, range of motion, pain inflection and internal rotation. Nowadays it's called the impingement test and also limp. Osteoarthritis was graded according to the Turnis classification. And finally, we calculated predictive factors to reach one of these endpoints. Therefore, we used the Cox regression analysis and we evaluated demographic, clinical, radiographic, as well as surgery related factors. Here are the results. At 30 years follow up, 50 hips reached an endpoint. This included 43 hips with a total hip arthroplasty. There were four hips with progression of osteoarthritis and not yet a total hip, and seven hips with a bad clinical outcome. We know from the previous two studies that the survival rate of the native hip at 10 years was 88% and at 20 years 61% and now at 30 years later it's 29% survival. This means 
that in about one third of all the patients with PAO from the very initial series, the patient has no total hip, no progression of osteoarthritis, and a good clinical result. We also found an increased Meldobony score in those hips with preserved joint after 30 years. Limp and the impingement test decreased compared to the preoperative st status, and we found a decreased range of motion for flexion, internal rotation, as well as abduction. These are the results for osteotriatis. We had a complete follow-up in 66 hips, and the majority, 50 hips, had either grade zero or grade one, according to Tönnies. Now, if you look to them into details, you can see that of those 30 hips with grade zero preoperatively, 50% remained without uh, osteotriatic changes 30 years later. Some progressed, and 40% had a conversion to a total hip arthroplasty. In the next group with preoperatively grade one, there were still 15 hips that remained in this uh, status, but most of them progressed and the, the rate of total hips increased to 80%. In this initial series, there were also a couple hips with grade two and even with grade three, and you can see that uh, the rate of total hip arthroplasty increases from 40, 80, to 93 and 100 percent, this was only one, uh, one patient in this uh, group of grade 3. So the preoperative osteotriatis grade uh, defines whether there is a high need for conversion to total hip or not. We found additional factors, negative predictive factors. In total, there were seven. They did not change a lot compared to those found after 20 years. There was one demographic factor. There were five clinical and one radiographic factor. It was age. At the age of 40, the hazard ratio was 4.3 times higher. This means the, the risk to convert or to reach any of these previously defined endpoints is 4.3 times higher than in a patient uh, in, with an age less than 40 years. We found a couple uh, clinical factors. These are all preoperative uh, parameters. So when a patient has uh, a bad hip with, uh, with pain and the male dobinier score of less than 14 points, the hazard ratio was 6.3 and also limp and uh, the anterior and the posterior uh, impingement test were negative protective factors. So were internal rotation preoperatively less than 20 degrees, so if a hip had less than 20 degrees preoperatively, this was also a negative predictive factor. And we, as we could show in the previous slide, osteotriatis is one major negative predictive factor for long-term outcome. Here are a couple examples. This is a 15-year-old female patient with a hip dysplasia. We could follow up her 10 years. She has a very good-looking joint with a wide joint space. Even after 20 years, the, the joint could, uh, could remain without additional degenerative signs. And even after 30 years, the joint space is still looking very good. This is another case. It's, a, it's an older patient. It's, uh, she was already painful before surgery, and she has a, a marked decrease in the joint space with and a 10-year follow-up that was end-stage coxotriatis, which had to be replaced by the total hip joint. Back to the very first case from 1984. This young lady uh, showed up at the 20-year follow-up. She was satisfied with her joint. She had uh, subsequent surgeries, uh, such as a uh, shelf osteoarthroplasty, uh, but she was very satisfied at 20 years, and we could follow up her just recently. She still got her hip joint with a little less uh, joint space with, but she still satisfies and, and not much limited in her daily life. Of course, we got a, a couple of limitations of this study. First, it's the learning curve and the first experience of a new surgical technique. So. Uh, with the current technique and the current indication, the, the results can be expected to be better and also have to be proven to be better at a 10-year follow-up. It's a very heterogeneous series of patients, different indications, previous surgery, and also varying degrees of osteoarthritis. This most likely makes the survival rate 
worse, but nevertheless, it's very valuable for statistical analysis, then you can calculate all these predictive factors. We had to use the Merle Daubigny score, which is not a very sensitive score for osteoarthritis or hip dysplasia, but we had to due to the retrospective nature of the study. And of course, we have no control group. We heard from Dr. Weinstein about the natural cause of hip dysplasia, or we can compare it to the other results in literature. This is a, uh, a busy graph, but here on the extra, uh, x axis you have the, the years of follow up, on the y axis you have the survival rates. There are three different colors. The blue ones are the Benice uh, PAOs. Then you have the rotational and the Chiari osteotomies as the green and the, the red bubbles. And you can see the longer the follow up, the, the less the survival. And uh, the, you almost can see here a linear uh, um, regression of survival and uh, follow up years. So, in conclusion, we could show that at third year follow up, 29% of the very first hips undergoing PEO had a good clinical result, did not convert to total hip, and showed no progression of osteoarthritis. And key factors for long term outcome is the age of the patient, uh, the osteoarthritis before the operation, and the good function in hip with uh, little pain. Thank you. <laughs>